In today's video, I'm very excited to share something a little bit different and very special, and that's that I'm going to be sharing some highlights from the workshops that I did last weekend. So if you don't know, I added some new bonuses to my True Rhythm Mastery course, which were live workshops that happened last weekend, and they were covering how to sort of build your library of automatic rhythm patterns so you can see a rhythm and immediately know how it fits into the beat, using the metronome to make the fast notes easy, going into sort of the neuroscience of how learning fast notes work and how to actually really practice fast notes so that you're able to tackle them confidently and consistently. And then the last one was sort of hot seats and Q&A where people brought some specific tricky rhythms that they were struggling with and I sort of helped talk them through it and we worked through them together to feel more comfortable and confident with them. The workshops were absolutely amazing. People really enjoyed them and I think got a lot out of them. So I wanted to take some highlights from those workshops and kind of share them with everybody so that you could get at least a little bit of the value from those workshops and so that I can help as many people as possible in their rhythm journeys. You can get the whole replays of all three workshops as part of a bonus to the True Rhythm Mastery course. So if you go to Quick Start Clarinet, net.com slash rhythm and get the True Rhythm Mastery course, then you'll get the entire full length video course, as well as the entire recordings of these three workshops. But without further ado, let's go ahead and give a listen to these highlights. I hope that you get some valuable rhythm stuff from this. And as always, leave a comment if there's anything else I can do to help with your rhythm journey or any specific rhythm questions that you have. So we can start with this kind of upbeat and see, okay, this is on the and of two, sustaining through three. Uh, so you just turn that into a measure that you're in a loop just to get that automatic. One, two, and, four, one, two, and, four, one, two, and, four. Let's try that together. I think that'll be good practice. So, and this is good that this is a completely different tempo than I just sang, so you can't do what you just heard me do, you actually have to figure it out. So let's try that together. <laughs> two, ready, go. One, two, and four. One, two, and four. One, two, and four. One, two, and four. So basically what we're doing is we know how to do one and two and three and four and from the normal subdivision exercise. Now we're just sort of plugging that into, it's the and of two, just the and of two leading to three. And then we could look at the next measure, which is one, two, and of two leading to three, which we already did, so we're good at that. But then also the and of three leading to four. Um, let me actually draw this in on this because I think that'll just be helpful to really anchor in this idea. So we have uh, and of three, one and two, and leading to three, and leading to four, and those are tied. Oh, not in white. <laughs> tied, tied. So that's basically what we're doing, is we've taken that little chunk of trickiness in that rhythm, and now we're building it into an automatic pattern by doing just that. So let's try that together. Two, ready, go. One, two, and, and, two, and, and, one, two, and, and. And as we're doing this, make sure that you sort of keep moving with it because that's gonna be your, your strongest connection internally to the beat. One, and, two, and, three, and, four, and, and, two, and, three and four and and you could even add in some subdivisions to help you out doing something like one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one the idea is we're always predicting when that next beat is going to be and we know how that specific rhythm pattern fits into the beat do you have a question yeah i was gonna say i think it's um a case of sticking to one style of counting that works for your, you know, your brain, because you've got several, lots of different ways of doing it. 
and mixing them all up is kind of like mixing up you know <laughs> my brain as well so I think I think it's a case of finding the the the, the words or the or the counting or the letters or whatever way you want to do it that you like you feel the best with and then doing it always in that style and then I think you you can compare one bar to another does that make any sense I don't know yeah I, I totally understand what you're saying yeah. I'm not a hundred <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm not a hundred percent sure if I actually agree with it though all right um, okay because, because I the the logic behind it is good because if you're always counting the same rhythm the same all the time that totally makes sense but yeah. i think where we go to the next step where we really have mastery of it is when we can say whatever we want and still be connecting to the beat in the right way and every rhythm counting system is designed to show how to connect to the beat um so if we're doing one e a two or a taka Takadimi would be taka mi ta, taka mi ta. Gordon system would be uh, du ta ta du, du ta ta du. I could say uh, uh, some people do like words and like fruits and stuff. Um, I don't know what this one would be, but you could say whatever you want, and yeah. the it's it's totally a good idea to stick with a system that you like. But the, the true sign of mastery will be when you can connect to the beat, no matter what syllables you're saying, and, and you know how, mm. how it fits in. Fast finger freak out idea. Um, I talk about that, that quite a bit. And basically what that looks like is when we see a piece of music like this, and we see it and think, whoa, that's that's fast, there's accidentals, it's complicated, it looks a little intimidating, there's a pickup note, all kinds of crazy stuff happening. And then when we go to try to play it, we do something like wiggle our fingers while praying a little bit that we hope that we make it to the downbeat on time. And then when we're done playing it, we're sort of left thinking, okay, was that actually right? Did, did I get the right notes? Did I get the right rhythm? And often if we tried to put this with the metronome, it would just be a nightmare and, and really, really stressful. That's when we're in sort of peak fast finger freak out. And the consequences of always having fast finger freak out is that in the ensemble, it becomes really muddy. It makes practice really frustrating because you're sort of just stuck looking at that and being like, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. I hope it's right. I don't even know if it was right but I'm going to do it again because I guess that's what practicing is supposed to be. Then you have very inconsistent execution. Sometimes those things like will go right every now and then it just feels like it worked out and, and you got it. But more often than not, it's pretty inconsistent and you don't feel confident that when you get to the performance, you're actually going to be able to do it correctly. And the last consequence, which is less intuitive is that you often end up actually getting ahead. Now we need to look at the actual practice plan for how we're going to tackle this. So the way that we would normally do this and this the, the wrong way probably actually works pretty decently on the, the very simple stuff in the music that you can sight read on your first try. But the wrong way is where we're getting the notes under our fingers and we're sort of taking that approach of just like, okay, I just gotta learn these notes and I'll, I'll figure it out. This I talked about in one of the emails is actually kind of silly because you already know how to play the notes. If you know how to play the chromatic scale, you know how to play all of the notes. And yes, they're going to be in a little bit different order. So you have to kind of find that unique order to the notes. But the idea of getting the notes under your fingers, I think is sort of a, a misnomer and actually not a productive way to practice at all. Because again, you play your scales, the notes are already under your fingers. What you need is to actually figure out how the timing of the works notes work. And that's the right way of doing it is go slow and most importantly, steady. You honestly don't even necessarily need to go slow. There might be things that you can play fast as long as you're playing it steady and ideally with the metronome to ensure that it's steady. 
then you're in good shape. That's probably, if there's one thing you take away from this whole presentation is that idea. When you're practicing, you need to be doing it steadily because that's what's actually gonna program the right music into your head. We're trying to program the subconscious and that's what muscle memory is. There really is no such thing as true muscle memory. When you have that feeling of like, oh, my fingers just kind of took over and just wiggled where they needed to wiggle and everything went well. We call that muscle memory, but it's not actually our fingers remembering. It's more of our subconscious mind remembering and, and doing it automatically. So what we need to be doing while we're practicing is using our conscious mind to know what's correct, know what we want, and use the conscious mind to program the subconscious and put it into muscle memory. The neuroscience behind this and how this actually works is basically summed up as our brain gets good at doing whatever it's doing. Our subconscious just gets better at doing what it's doing. And the reason for that is this thing called the myelin sheath and the idea of myelination. And what this is, is our neurons, which are the things that fire and tell our fingers to move. The neurons, when they fire, they send an electrical pulse through the muscles to get them to move. And the more a neuron fires, the more the brain will build up a myelin sheath around it. And what this myelin sheath does is basically insulates that circuit so that it can fire faster. So to have sort of faster reaction time with wiggling our fingers and be able to more quickly go from play an F to my first finger playing an F or a B flat, um, the, the way to get that to go faster is to develop a more insulated thicker myelin sheath around that neural network and that circuit that needs to fire. The really important part of this is to keep that conscious filter on because again, the subconscious just gets good at doing whatever we're doing. And this is why the metronome and the steadiness is so important because if we're going through without a really clear idea of how we want it to go and really getting it precise and sort of just doing <laughs> and just kind of mushing through it. It sounds like kind of okay, but I'm just programming and mushing through it that last time I actually even played extra notes from it. Um, so having that engaged always to make sure the information going in is the information that we want to be going in. Also, I keep pointing at the back of my head for the subconscious because that's where the, the cerebellum is, which is the part of the brain that controls motor movement. So that's kind of a nice visual for me is that it's like the, the frontal cortex is the part that comprehends how I want the music to go and is in control of making sure if it's right or not. And that part is sort of programming the subconscious muscle movement. Yeah, the first thing here is definitely to make sure you know where your beat anchors are in the first place. Of course, one is on the rest. And then the trick is we have, yeah, yeah, we have um, beat two is on a beat, so that's nice. But beat three ties into the beat, and then beat four is on the beat again. So really beat three is the only very ambiguous one but then how the stuff in between fits gets a little bit wonky. I think you could start by identifying some of these individual beats. So like this one is the suite of old American dances that we were looking at. So just maybe doing a measure of this rhythm on loop. One E, a two E, a three E, a four E, a one E, a two E, a three E, a four E, a one. Being really secure and confident with that rhythm could be great. And then Beat three and four are actually basically the same. So making sure that you're really comfortable with one E and, two E and, three E and, four E and, one E and, two E and, three E and, four E and would be a, a great thing to do as well. Then we put that together and it's especially this tie that's yeah, the trick. Definitely. Yeah, where we kind of have this, this reacting to the beat with the E here where it reacts to uh, beat two here and also kind of 
you maybe you could think about it as leading to the upbeat of and but that might be the real sort of magic rhythm that once you get that rhythm down then the measure will be easy so practicing e and e and e and e and and i think you start by doing it without the tie one e and two e and three e and four e and and then start whispering the numbers e and 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 for e and does that make sense yeah good um and if you can get that down, then that'll actually also help with this measure because this is also starting in the same place with this E. A 2E, a 2E, a 2E, where you have that, that starting on the E of the beat. Yeah, this is a good one that we haven't really talked about this particular pattern yet. As always, we can look at our beat anchors and we know one, one. two, and three, triplet, four is somewhere in there and then we get to one the, right. where four is exactly is actually between the f sharp and the d between the second and third triplet and this gets a little complicated the fancy word for this is hemiola where we have three against two where we're clapping one two one two but the rhythm is doing one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. So the way it lines up is, is tricky. The easiest way to get this is to not worry so much about beat four, actually, and just spread these three notes out from beat three going to beat one. At a slower tempo, and the slower tempo you get, the more difficult this is. If this okay. was really fast, then it would be easy to do one and three triplet four and three, four, one and three triplet one, one and three triplet one. But if it's really slow, one and three triplet one, yeah, then it becomes a little bit more cumbersome uh, to, to line that up. I still think the easiest way to do it is just focus on starting on three and then playing three even notes as well as you can going to one. Three, so you three, can actually, okay. yeah, you can almost ignore beat four and actually not feel beat four for the, the simple okay. version of how to get this and just sort of watch the conductor. One and three triplet one and just make sure you land at one well. And there's probably other people playing quarter note triplets too, so you can sort of settle into where that's at um, and, and just make sure that you land at one. The more advanced way to do it, and maybe eventually if you wanna be really precise with your quarter note triplets, is to actually feel it with the connection to beat four. I'll go over the way to do that as well, um, okay. because I think it's good information to know. Um, to do that, we need to figure out sort of where in the triplet does this actually land and how do we actually connect to beat four. And if we rewrite this as in eighth note triplets, then that becomes a little bit more feasible to do. Um, so this is what it would look like in eighth note triplets. And we know how eighth note triplets connect to the beat, just three triplet, four triplet. Mm -hmm. And now it becomes an exercise of figuring out the ties. So that's, these are equivalent uh, rhythms, but now we can see where beat four is there. And of course, beat three is there. There's a cool little okay. trick to do this if, if you like really want to practice it. Um, and that's to use a two syllable word with these to know where the, the quarter note triplets start. The one that I learned is taco. So what you do is you get the eighth note subdivision going. And again, this would be like an automatic rhythm pattern thing to do is to go one triplet, two triplet, da, 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 da. So these are the uh, eighth note triplets. Da, 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 da. And then say your two syllable word, and that shows you where the quarter note triplet is. 
Ta 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 taco 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 ta 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 taco 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 ta 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 taco 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 ta and then eventually you just say the first syllable of the two syllable word ta 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 ta